Hello everybody and welcome to this Innovation Live Zone hosted by Wound Care Today and we are live at the conference in Milton Keynes. The session is kindly sponsored by Region Medical. My name is Alison Schofield. I'm clinical manager at Mold Digital and a tissue viability nurse. And I am honored to have with me today, um, Mr. Bill Tettelbach, and he is medical director and wound for wound and infection prevention at Encompass Health and holds an appointment at Duke University School of Medicine. And he is from the United States of America. So welcome, Bill. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's exciting. So, um, there is a crisis, we know, of hard to heal wounds and the time to act is now. But how are we tackling some of those fundamentals? How can we find simple ways to make an impact, but an impact that will deliver and drive better wound healing? The evidence tells us that we can make a real difference when it comes to wound bed preparation. So, as a community of healthcare professionals, what do we have as expectations? What's the reality and how we, can we bridge that gap? So we, historically within nursing and those of you in our audience at home and live here in the studio today will, will resonate with the fact that when we always talked about wound cleansing and wound bed preparation, we used to kind of go a little bit gently at it. We didn't talk in terms of vigorous wound bed preparation. Um, and we used to get, you know, when we, we got the wound to its optimal state of what we thought was, you know, the, the tissue was granulating, clean and granulating. We say, oh, well, don't disturb it because it will, you know, will we'll damage the, those lovely fresh granulation tissues. And that was the language that we used, wasn't it? You know, so we, we were, you know, very gentle in, in our approach. But we, there's more and more evidence, obviously, and we're, we're, we're learning much more now. Um, and we know that biofilm is an issue um, and it, obviously we need to look at infection prevention and we've got the wound infection continuum, you know, that we've got, you know, great guidance out there to, to, to drive us. Um, but, I, you know, if um, I'm going to ask Bill if he can just summarise for us a little bit around biofilm and about elements of, um, of debridement that we have. Yeah, so I think, you know, you mentioned that word crisis, you know, we, you know, wound care coming out of the pandemic would clearly access people not wanting to be seen as much, you know, we are, we got behind, I think, where we were two years ago and getting people healed, the wounds are coming in worse, but a, a big part of that now is, is addressing and having the right skill set to clean these wounds, not just, you know, with hygiene, but also with, you know, sharp debridement, like surgical debridement, and what we're really trying to deal with is remove some of the biofilm every time that we do debride these. And the biofilm itself is a big uh, culprit in perpetuating this inflammation you know, within the wound bed and elevating the, the metaboteloproteases like collagenase and elastinase that break this down. And the biofilms themselves are made of polysaccharides, glycoproteins, uh, parts of the DNA from the bacteria that are forming these. And there's not a lot of good tools out there to actually remove it. You know, we have, I think, in the States, we've used enzymatic debriding or chemical debriding, but these are really slow and long processes. And when we're dealing with these, the longer these wounds stay open, you know, the whole infection continuum, the more these folks are at risk of getting infection. And if, if a diabetic with a diabetic foot ulcer who gets infected, their rate or their risk of getting amputated goes up over 150 percent that's or times it's incredible so getting these wounds closed uh with through these basic techniques that have been that we've been struggling with i've been in this for over 20 years i've met people who've been over 30 years it's the same thing it's the same topic we, but we have to get on top of this yeah and um the, you know one of the things that issues that we have certainly in the UK I don't know about in the US is that um, you know we, we don't all have access to those debridement skills like mechanical debridement sh well sharp debridement really um, it would be deemed that it would be for the specialist um, clinician like myself as a TVN but even so the f f you know funding for education has been reduced so access even for the tissue viability nurse on these courses you know has gone down 
Um, we have a change in workforce, so we have more healthcare assistants um, do, performing wound intervention. And we, you know, I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do, but it's about if if we have that, and we know that from the burden of wound care study that Julian Guest did, it showed right. us those figures. Um, so we need to ensure that for the patient and for their wounds that we are um, having tools available so people can carry out cleansing, debridement combined, um, you know, on the, that first contact and then on the, you know, every, uh, every dressing, those, you know, we've, we've got a new consensus document out on wound hygiene and again it's just different language what do we call it but ultimately the important thing is that we we can have something available that is going to be effective at cleansing and debridement in the absence of of us be, being able to use to use the sharps and and people keep saying to us oh if we, we say if you had a magic wand what would you what would you have and they say time more yeah. time so we we want to be able to have something um that that does does that, is, would you agree? Yeah, I would ag agree with that. So we, the, the thing with wound care is it's a, you know, a multi-specialty specialty. I mean, we, you know, in the States, we have, uh, I think, more of the specialty clinics. Mm. But in the NHS system, there's far more community nurses and far more community touches where that can be really effective. But the thing is, is we don't tend to deploy things quick enough or refer folks into those areas uh, soon enough. And you know, we mentioned or we start hearing that we need to stop managing wounds, we need to start healing wounds. And so even in the states, we have you know, the title you know, wound care clinic, but more and more over the years, it's been, they've even changed those names to wound healing clinics. And we have to think about the, the goal is not to manage and just take care of, it's to, it's to actually he, you know, heal these. And granted, everyone has a different level of skill set. So education's key on understanding what the other individual who may have a higher skill set can do for you versus what you're av available or what's available to you. One of the things I think we have even in the seats here is you know, the, the wound clean sheets here that can be used in the outpatient setting, the community setting where they can be uh, gentle scrubbing, that can actually reduce or remove some of these biofilm, but even disorganized cellular matrices, which is sort of that slough, that's not really the biofilm. The biofilm's underneath that. It's somewhat invisible. It actually penetrates into the wound bed. But reducing that and bringing it down every time you have that visit and then putting an antimicrobial dressing or something that has an antimicrobial property inhibits the reformation of that biofilm. So every time you come in, you can lower the bio burden in the wound bed and slowly allow the wound to start closing once the inflammation, there's a certain critical level of bio burden. So typically around 10 to the fifth colony uh, forming units per gram. If you can get it down below that, the wound will start healing on its own with standards of care. And that's what you know we need to do. But if you, there are, no matter how much you get rid of the inflammation, there's always gonna be some folks who just won't go on to heal. And that's who we, we can't just sit on them for a year. We need to get those folks referred into the clinic, I think more quickly, where more sharp debridement can be performed on, the, on those patients. Yeah, and it, it's, it's, it's that mix, isn't it? Because we are doing the day-to-day -day stuff at home or we, in whichever setting, but we, we, we need to have those specialist services yeah. as well. So, so we can, you know, um, we, we get in the right end result, like you say again moving language from you know chronic wounds which kind of suggests that well they're just going to be there forever into you know hard but surprisingly hard they don't have to be there forever no. we can we can change yeah. we can turn that around i mean like venous leg ulcers you know you'll hear through this conference compression but debridement is a is a big part of that and getting some even just getting a few aggressive debridements on, in for that patient and then transferring back into the community center can make all the, the differences. We're all a team. I mean, no matter what level of tissue viability nurses and the community nurses and the vascular surgeons, we're all a team on this. Yeah, and how does products like hydro, hydrochlorus, did I say that yeah, right? Yeah, so, how, do, how does that work? Yeah, so hy like that's something we can be using in the outpatient setting. We have deployed that in our in outpatient clinics very heavily. Hypochlorous acid is naturally occurring in the body. It's the white, the macrophages uh, make this with the lysosomes. They convert water and oxygen to hydrogen peroxide. 
through NADPH, myeloperoxidase quickly converts that to hypochlorous acid, which adds a chloride group, so you get HOCl. That, hype, that reactive chloride ion binds to the bacteria and kills it within seconds. So when you put this on the wound bed, you will kill the free-floating bacteria within eight to 15 seconds. Wow. So if you let it sit on there for two minutes and then change your dressing, you've done a lot just to reduce the bacterial load, but you can even use it to moisten your alginates. And you lay, instead of normal saline, just lay that on with the uh, uh, alginate moistened with the hypochlorous and you'll get an extended uh, exposure and you'll start penetrating those biofilms that can overcome the positive and negative charges in there and actually disaggregate. It's one of the few simple items you can use that will s start disaggregation of those biofilms on a chemical level. So that comes back to that time in practice, yeah. doesn't it? Because that the speed of that, that is rapid. You know, we're not waiting for things to soak forever. And I remember the days, some of you will, when we used to be going getting buckets of water and lined buckets. And sometimes maybe yeah. we still do that in clinics. But we, you know, we, we're we've now moved on. We've got yeah. these things available. I didn't have available when I was a district nurse. So just in summary then, Bill, we need cost-effective solutions for wound bed preparation. The message needs to be simple and backed by evidence always. And there's some excellent technologies available to yeah. support us. Yeah. Some very simple, like the hypochlorous is very simple. And you don't have to get a bucket of water when you have a pad that can you can just open up and start uh, using that to cleanse the wound. Yeah, simple. That's what we like. <laughs> <laughs> so for more information, you can see on screen um, Region Medical that you can contact. And um, we're just going to play you a short video um, of some of these amazing technologies. Mm -hmm.